Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, March 24th. Our topic today is our featured teacher, who is Paula Fellinger, and her, she's going to be telling us about going global in the classroom with your students. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. I'm going to now turn the mic over to Peg, who is going to introduce Paula and ask her the newbie question. Well, thank you very much. We have another exciting show today. Paula Fallinger has worked, has been in the East Penn School District for 19 years and has taught both first and second grades at West Coville Elementary School. She received her teaching certificate from Moravian College and earned master's degrees in classroom technology, instructional technology, and instructional media from Wilkes University. Paula is a Keystone Technology Innovator Star of 2016. She is currently working on becoming a Google Certified Educator. Paula is the second grade level district leader at East Penn and serves on several committees within the district to support grading and curriculum initiatives. She also leads and teaches several PD courses in the district. Recently, Paula presented a session about taking her classroom global at Pete and C, which is the Pennsylvania Educational Technology Expo and Conference in Hershey, Pennsylvania. When she's not teaching, Paula enjoys cheering on her two sons, Colin and Carter, at their sporting and middle school events. I'm very excited to have Paula on the show today, so let's begin with the newbie question. Okay, Paula, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Okay, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, newbie question, that's a great one. I think um, in the past when we thought about the Web and the Internet, we thought mostly about finding information and Googling something, and perhaps maybe leaving a comment somewhere, a very passive type of experience. But to me, Web 2.0 provides a much more interactive experience. We can collaborate more and create things. And that's a big thing. We want our students to take the knowledge and skills they're learning to be creators and collaborators. So it's a natural fit for us to use the Web 2.0 tools in the classroom. And there are so many Web 2.0 tools that allow students to collaborate with each other and interact with each other whether it's social networking sites, video sharing sites, uh, the Google Suite components. It, and it's never been easier to have students work with each other and get immediate feedback from each other and also immediate teacher feedback. The Web 2.0 tools really open up a world of opportunities for students that will help prepare them for their present and also for their future. Okay, so with that, I'd like to welcome you to my experiences with going global. And I have my Twitter um, address there for me and for my classroom. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and the differences um, between those two Twitter accounts that I have as we go through the presentation. So if any good presentation would start, I'll take you with me grocery shopping, which definitely is something that I do not like. And I don't, know if, I don't know if anybody really likes grocery shopping, but for me, not one of my favorite things to do. And for me, I actually live in the same district that I teach. So grocery shopping can be a very interesting experience for me. And this was way back my very first year of teaching. Um, I was grocery shopping. And as I turn the corner, I see one of my students there. And I think I surprised him more than he surprised me. And I get that deer in the headlights look. And he really didn't have anything to say to me. And, and I look and look. And I think his mother maybe was more surprised than I was. And she kind of looked and didn't know who I was. It was right in the beginning of the year. And I assured her I was not a stranger. I, I was the teacher. And, and she kind of looked at me and, and smiled and nodded. And, and he really didn't have anything to say. And he whispered something to her. And she looked at me kind of horrified. And she said, well, he, he thought you lived at school. And I said, oh, no, no, I assure you, I, I don't live at school. And, and we kind of chuckled about it. And then afterwards, I thought, wow, this is really not good. You know, 
he really doesn't think that I have a life outside of school. So there it was, you know, teachers do have a life outside the classroom. So for him, this experience kind of blew his mind. You know, me, the teacher, he thinks I live at school, I, I just stay overnight and I, I don't leave that classroom. So for me, you know, it kind of made me think, okay, I'm an extension of the learning. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't think that. He didn't know that. Um, now, that was really a problem. If he couldn't connect me with his learning, he couldn't connect his learning with the real world. And wasn't that really my job? I'm supposed to be preparing him for the real world. So now take a step forward and there it goes. Now my mind is blown. Okay. I need to do my job. I need to connect his learning with the real world. So there you go. That was my problem to solve. So how was I going to do that? So I had to make connections. So it kind of evolved over the years. So, you know, we had reading buddies. We ventured upstairs in my school. We got together with a fourth grade class. So at that point, I was teaching first grade. So my first graders and fourth graders went. We read. We did projects together. We made connections within the school. Um, we also had pen pals. I don't know if any of you did that. That was real old school. We, we got another class, and, and we were pen pals with them, pencil and paper pen pals. And then came the e-pals. Then you did it over email. Um, so we were doing our best on making connections. And I think we did a good job with that. Um, field trips, bringing authors in. We had assemblies. So we've, we've done what, we've, what we could, and I thought we did a good job. Um, I also have a star student um, program that I do with my kids where we learn each other. We learn more about each other. So the kids bring in things from home, and they teach each other about themselves. Um, I always start off the year with me being the first star student. And I remember one little girl um, looked at me as I'm bringing in pictures of my family, and she said, Mrs. Salinger, you have a mom? You have a dad? And I said, yes, I do. So it's just interesting what they say. But now, you know, you could walk into the classroom, and my students know a lot about me. They know my favorite color. They know my favorite snack food, and um, it's, it's very interesting. So you do have to open up. You have to let them know about you and let them know you're a real person in order to make those connections. Um, so that's, that's what I've done. So that's kind of how this whole thing kind of got started. But I, I knew I had to do more. I had to go outside of my classroom. So that's kind of how the whole going global thing got started. Um, and the best thing about going global is it's free. You don't need to buy anything. It doesn't have to be fancy. You need a computer or a device, and you need the internet. So there it is. This is a bulletin board that I have uh, located outside my classroom. So I have the Global Read Aloud. I have Skype. I have Twitter. And the Global Math Pass Twitter Challenge. So those are the four main um, ideas, the four main programs, things that I use um, that we kind of mark on. I have a United States map, and then I have the world map. So every time we make a connection, we go to the map, we find it there, and we put our little marker in there. And I know a lot of teachers do this, but it kind of just shows the students where we're making these connections. Um, so that's kind of how we um, mark it on our world map for the students. Um, so it began. And I kind of, before we go into how I make my connections, I kind of want to give you my most valuable advice. So here we go. So the first thing is make one goal. And this is a big one. There's so much out there, so much to do. You kind of have to scale back and really make one goal. So I thought, you know what? I like to shop. And I'm an Amazon shopper. So I saw this on Amazon as I was going around. I thought, this is so cool. It's kind of like one of those big scratch-off and step lottery tickets, if you've ever seen this. It's a United States map. And as you go around the map, you kind of scratch off each state that you visit. So I thought, this is so cool. This will keep me on task. We can scratch off each state as we go. But this is so cool. I'm going to do it. Well, then I start thinking, wow, 50 states, OK, 50 connections, OK, time zones, OK, I think I can do this. But then I thought, how many weeks are we in school? Is this really going to be doable? And then I had to reel myself back, and I thought, hmm, this might be a little bit more than I can handle. So then I had to rethink. Okay, let's make one realistic goal. 
I do want to make a goal, but you do want to make it an achievable goal. So make one realistic goal. So my realistic goal was be innovative. And I think that's real important. So every year I do this, I want to be innovative. So I thought I want to do something every year that I've not done before, something that's a little bit different. So this past year, my innovative goal was with a global read aloud, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I saw from the poll, a lot of you have done the global read aloud, and the premise is one book that's shared across the world, and you make connections with that one book. So this year, I chose with my second grade class to pick a chapter book. So the chapter book was Fenway and Hattie by Victoria Poe. So I thought, okay, I have a lot of primary connections with this book, but wouldn't it be absolutely cool to do a crossover, is what I called it, and connect my second graders with older students who are reading the other chapter books, the middle school and high school chapter books. That would be innovative. That would be kind of cool. Let me let my second graders connect with older students. Okay, they have different things to offer. The read aloud books were A Long Walk to Water, The Wild Robot, and A Monster Call. And if you know anything about these books, and I know we have a wealth of uh, people with us here today, um, those books are definitely not second grade level books. So I thought this could be a bit tricky, this could be a little bit challenging. Well, there's a face group, a face group book at the, with the global read aloud. So I took a picture of my class and don't they look so cute there, holding the book and put out my plea. Can we please have some older students who would want a mystery Skype, Skype or Google Hangout with my class to discuss their books with my students? Characters, settings, um, let's try to make it doable for my second grade kids. We just want to share the love of reading and give these kids a good experience. I got so much feedback within the first couple hours I put this request out and I was able to connect with two sixth grade classes and a seventh grade class. We did a mystery skate game, and we were able to talk about the books. And these middle school kids were phenomenal. We had such a rich experience. Um, they did a great job telling my kids about their books in a very appropriate way. Um, it was a wonderful experience. So I was able to reach my innovative goal. We connected and had a great time. So goal does not have to be anything spectacular, but be innovative. I did something totally different with my kids. Never did anything like that before, so I was happy with my goal. Next piece of information for you, create a focus. You have the whole world out there, so you definitely have to be focused when you want to go global. Okay, you can't do everything out there. So definitely find your balance, okay? You're going to want to do everything, and a lot of times I know when I um, listen to a webinar, when I go away for a conference, when you come out of faculty meeting, when you talk to other educators, you want to grab onto everything. You know, take a little piece back with you and definitely try one thing. You don't have to try a whole lot of things. Definitely quality over quantity, and that's what I try to live by. You definitely have to find that balance. You cannot do everything. So try to take a little piece of something back and do that little piece great. There'll be plenty of time to try out all of these different things, but you can't do everything right away. So find something, find a focus, and go with it and start from there. Next piece of advice is to keep a log of what you do, because really, you're probably doing a lot more than what you think you are. And for me, being a classroom teacher, there's a lot of paperwork you have to fill out at the end of the year also for your evaluation. And a lot of times you don't remember everything you're doing. And with going global, you have to be very organized as well. Because when you start making those classroom connections and you're reaching out to all these people, things start to get muddled. And then you forget, who am I supposed to be connecting with at this time? And what's their Twitter handle? What's their email address? What's their Skype name? So I'll give you just one example. I started creating Google Docs for different things that I was doing. So this is an example of a Google Doc for what I created for the Global Read Aloud. So I simply just made a chart with the date and different things that I was doing, whether it was something easy as visiting the author's website, doing some Flipgrid assignments, what I was doing with my students, who I was going to have a mystery Skype with, um, or a Google Hangout with, what we were doing. That way, when I go back 
either to let my principal know what I was doing, tell a colleague what I was doing, knowing when I was going to have my next global connection. Everything was right there for me. So definitely you have to be organized so things don't get confused. So you can be on time, be organized, um, and definitely know what you're doing and know your next step. So keep a log of what you're doing. Definitely the way to go. Next piece of advice, and this is one that I continue to work on every day, both professionally and personally, and this has to do with social media. Um, share and don't compare. Share, don't compare. I'll repeat that one again, and I'll tell you why. You are doing great things. Educators do wonderful things, and you can't let anybody throw shade on you or take that away from you at all. So this is one Twitter post that I have. Um, when we talk about Skype a little bit later, there's a couple programs that Skype in the Classroom puts out, and one happens to be this skype -a which is a program that they had, and it was two days in which Skype said, hey, let's see if we can travel 10 million miles around the globe, make as many global connections as you can, and let's make this a goal for everybody. And I thought, this sounds wonderful. Let's do this. Well, it happened to be the days that they picked were the two days coming off of Thanksgiving break. So I thought, okay, it's a short week for us. Plus, we were coming off of student conferences. Plus, okay, after Thanksgiving break, what do people mostly do? Well, a lot of people who celebrate Christmas, um, it's Black Friday shopping. All of those big, thick holiday catalogs come out. So kids my age, second grade, first grade kids, are looking at all the toy catalogs. They've maybe gone shopping. They visited Santa in the stores. So the hype is on. So when those kids come back to school, it's very chaotic. So it was kind of like the perfect storm. And I thought, okay, short week, we're coming off of conferences, which we have early dismissal days also. So we're trying to get back on track. So it was not the best timing to be planning all this um, for what I wanted to try to get back onto a regular week with my kids. But throw caution to the wind, and I'm going to do it anyway. So I kind of combined my be innovative goal, and I thought, I am not going to do United States connections. I'm truly going to go global, and I want to do international connections. So throw in some time zone constraints there, and I was really going for it. So I was able to make a connection for England and a connection for Italy. So I was super pumped and super proud of myself for organizing all of this. So we traveled to Italy, and here's my post. I actually had my kids traveling to Italy, and they were Skyping with college students. So it was a group of college students who were studying abroad from DeSales University. So they took time away from their exams, and we Skyped with them. And they did an awesome job with my kids, talking to them and explaining things to them. And we traveled 4,285 miles. It was wonderful. And I was so excited. I didn't even have time to tweet this until like 9 o'clock at night when I got home. So at that point, I tweeted it and I thought, okay, I'm just going to take a peek on Twitter and I'm going to see what everybody else was doing for skype -a -thon. So I, I did. I sat down and here's what I saw. Okay. Here's a tweet and if you notice, this teacher has high heels on, propped up on a globe. And she traveled to five countries, eight Skype calls. 30,000 miles. Well, let me just tell you, I felt so deflated after reading that. And then I, I saw another post. And if you count these little international flags, you'll see there's 11 international flags there. So then I read this other teacher's post. They travel to 11 different countries. So my measly little Italy call with 4,000 miles didn't seem so important at that point. But you can't let that kind of, you know, be disappointing to you. I was so proud, and my lesson learned was don't be discouraged by anything. Be happy for what you did. And these teachers, I still swear, they must not have gone to the bathroom or eaten lunch that day. That's, that's just what I'm saying. But my point to you is be happy for what you did. Be happy for what they did. Because everybody is doing great things. So share, 
don't compare. Okay. The next piece of advice is please be reliable. And this is a big one. Be reliable. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. If you say you're going to do something, do it. So this is an example of a global connection. It's a postcard exchange. And this is an awesome thing to do. I was lucky enough to be part of a group. And a lot of times there's teachers out there who will set up groups. And this is part of the global read aloud as well. One teacher, um, it was actually he set up 13 of us joined in. And he said, hey, let's do a postcard exchange. He got everybody's addresses together. And you had six weeks, that's how long the Global Read Aloud ran, six weeks to send out your postcards. And I thought, this is great. It's already set up for me. All I have to do is have 13 postcards, or 12 postcards, because I was teacher 13. We'll send them out, and this will be wonderful. So within the first two weeks, I got one postcard. So I thought, instead of sending my Pennsylvania postcard, we're going to make our own postcards. So I took a picture of the kids. The kids wrote personal messages. They all signed their name. And we sent them out. So after the six weeks, I got two postcards back. And the kids were so disappointed. And I thought, mm, this is not really good. So then in January, now this is a couple months after the Boulder Read Aloud ended, you know, we got two more postcards. So four out of, you know, 12, those aren't really good odds. So be reliable. But being an educator, you know, we always have a backup plan. So when the postcards didn't start coming in, you know, you can kind of see the disappointment in your kid's face. So I always have a backup plan. So my backup plan was, let's send a postcard to the author. Now, we were very lucky because our author was super involved with the Global Read Aloud. So I told the kids, hey, let's send a postcard to the author. Well, the author does not have a published address. So we had to go to plan B. So I put it on my kids. How are we going to get this postcard to the author? And this is something good about going global. And you'll find this out too. Going global is not just about technology. And it's not just about geography and maps. It's about so much more. It's about problem solving. And they said, well, what can we do? Well, we know that somebody helps the author. So we looked up the agent. We looked up the agent's address. We sent the agent the postcard. The postcard went from the agent. She forwarded it to the author. The author got it. And then the author tweeted us back. So that was pretty awesome. So then I, you, well, that's what you're seeing right now, a tweet from the author saying she got the postcard. So that was pretty cool. So even though the postcard exchange didn't go as planned, boom, there you go. The kids were super excited about that. So please be reliable. And I have one more example. This one was a little bit more, mm, disappointing for the kids. You know, we're waiting for that call to come. So we have 23 students, you know, sitting on the carpet waiting for that kid's call to come in and the phone never rings. So, of course, always have a backup plan. Um, and our backup plan is Flipgrid. And if you've ever used Flipgrid, I don't know if anybody has, it's an awesome, awesome tool, um, awesome program that you can use. You can record responses and it's a very fun way to go global, definitely on your own time. You can record videos back and forth and comment. So actually, the teacher who was supposed to call us had an emergency. We didn't know that. Um, that's why she didn't call us. But I knew she had a Flipgrid. We pulled up her Flipgrid, and we actually just recorded a response back to her. So instead of calling her, we kind of sent her a Flipgrid message. So we still did get our global connection with her. Um, but instead of talking to her, we used the Flipgrid. So it all turned out well. Okay, this is another good piece of advice. Be comfortable. Definitely want to be comfortable going global. And a lot of you have used Skype too, but if you've never used Skype, um, the first call is always the hardest. But although you do want to be comfortable, definitely push yourself outside your com comfort zone, even if, if it's just a little bit. And I did that this year. Even though I've done Skype calls before, Google Hangouts before, I've never done anything like this. And it was a four-state Google Hangout. So four teachers decided, let's get together, and we're going to read a chapter of our Global Read Aloud book together. Um, it was a little nerve-wracking, because now instead of just one connection, there were four. So that's four connections I had to worry about. Were all the teachers going to show up? What if somebody couldn't get connected? What if somebody got dropped out? And this was perhaps like the most awesome, fun experience ever. 
So these are teachers who I maybe have Skyped with before, but it was so cool to hear them reading aloud to the class. And I got to read aloud to four classes at the same time, at the same time, which was like the coolest thing ever. So please push yourself out of your comfort zone, even if it's just a little. Um, this was a real awesome experience for me. I think I had more fun than the kids did, but they really liked it. And it was just so neat to have another teacher reading to my class. And my kids were so engaged to all four teachers. It was a fun experience. Um, and this was so cool. Um, this wasn't to do with the global read aloud. This was another connection that we made. Um, this was a story we were reading called Long Ago and Today. And it was a story about things from long ago. And every year, my parents, who my dad is going to be 90 this year, and my mom is just a little bit behind him, um, they write a letter to my kids about things from long ago, things about phonographs. My dad writes about his pea shooter and about sledding in the streets when the police used to close them down in Jim Thorpe. And my kids, um, two years ago, wanted to know more about these pea shooters that my dad was talking about because we had no idea. And they said, can we Skype your parents? And I said, well, guys, my parents don't have Skype. And they're like, well, we want to talk to them. And I said, well, what are you going to do? So again, throw it back at them and let them problem solve. Even though they're second graders, they come up with some great ideas. They said, well, they don't have Skype. Hmm. Well, we can call them on the phone. I said, you could call them on the phone, and, but they want to see my parents. So then they said, does your, does your mom or dad have a smartphone? I said, nope, they don't have a smartphone. And they said, well, do they have an iPad? I said, my mom has a mini iPad. Can we FaceTime them? I said, yes, you can FaceTime them. So here we are FaceTiming my mom and dad. And if you look at the picture there, did my dad nail it? I couldn't get him to, to look at his face, so they talked to my dad's forehead. But what could be more awesome than my parents pushing themselves out of their comfort zone? So if my parents could do it, anybody could do it. So push yourself outside your comfort zone. Awesome. All right, so here's the most important thing. How do you get started? And it looks like a lot of you got started again, but maybe you know a teacher in your district who isn't started, or maybe you want to get started. There's two main ways that I get started, Twitter and Skype. So through Twitter, and I'll kind of blow by this, because I know a lot of you are on Twitter, um, just generally how to grow your PLN and creep around. But this is how I get started with um, Twitter. I have a class Twitter account. Start small and branch out. We usually tweet once a day. Um, I'm in charge of actually typing on Twitter. My students do come up with tweets. Sometimes we tweet together. Sometimes they write it. Now that Twitter has expanded how many characters you have, it's not as much of a problem. But I do give them graph paper that have the blocks with the number of characters. So they know to, type, to print each letter in a box with spaces and characters and hashtags so they don't go over the characters. Um, our parents like to see who tweets. They like to see who retweets or who likes it. Um, so that's a fun way to do it. This is also a way how I connect with my parents. So they like to see that. Also, this is a fun tidbit I picked up. Um, some of my parents aren't on Twitter. They don't want to join Twitter. They can actually follow us. You won't be able to see who's following you this way, but they can definitely, um, if they just text follow at Mrs. Failinger is my handle, but whatever username is 40404, they'll start receiving your tweets on a device. So that's how I stay connected. And they can get the daily tweet that we're doing. So that's kind of a cool tidbit. Follow other classes and make new friends. You can exchange tweets, pictures, videos, or have a flow chat. Create your own hashtag. You can create any hashtag you want, and then just tweet back and forth with that class or a group of classes and stay connected that way. And an example of a flow chat, um, we created a hashtag for the BFG that was uh, from a couple years ago, one of the stories from the Global Read Aloud. And we just had a chat for a whole week talking about that chapter of the book. And we were going back and forth. So that was kind of cool. You can tweet and tag experts and organizations related to your studies. This is a very great idea of how to ask questions, make any kind of curriculum. Um, connections that you want, tell your ideas. It brings that learning to life. Make your learning, take that learning outside of your classroom. Very easy way to do that um, with your students. So 
So a couple things that we did. We were reading a story about Magic Johnson. We tweeted him. He's got 4 million followers. Also a good way to kind of put things in perspective to your students as well. Do you think Magic Johnson's going to like our tweet? Do you think he's going to follow us back? You know, they have no concept of, you know, how many people follow Magic Johnson. Who does he follow? So it kind of puts in perspective, too, and kind of gives them an idea of the real world out there. They see him on TV and they think, hey, I can maybe meet him someday or, you know, just kind of gives them that whole real world perspective of what we're learning. We read a book on Bindi Irwin and we tweeted her, too, bring that learning to life. Take it from your classroom and pop it into the real world. This was a fun one, too. Jane Goodall Institute, we did tweet them after reading one of her stories. They have 1.4 million followers, and they actually liked our tweet. So the kids were so excited about that. That was such a cool thing. I think may, I was more excited than they were. But it just goes to show you, hey, guess what? Even though they have that many followers, they saw your tweet, and they liked it. So they are invested in our learning, just like we are. Our learning is important to them, too. Again, another global connection, another way to show them that the real world is interested in what you're learning. Go Noodle, for any of my elementary friends out there who are listening, um, this is a savior in the winter for us who have the snow, and I know a lot of you out there have the sunshiny weather. Um, great for brain breaks. They are great about retweeting and about liking, so they liked one of our tweets here, and the kids absolutely get so excited when the Go Noodle people like our tweets. And I'm so sad the Olympics only happen every two years, but we had so much fun with the Olympics, and this was such an awesome experience for us. We actually went to um, the Olympics this year. When I was presenting at the PEC um, event this year, one of the giveaways was Google Cardboard. So I brought that back to the classroom and the NBC um, virtual reality app was awesome. And actually the kids were able to go to the Olympic events and each student was able to pick what event they wanted to see and it, it was just awesome. They were able to be at the Olympics. So we decided, we did a lot of research on the Olympics and it was a lot of fun. We actually decided that we wanted to tweet some of the Olympians. So what we did, we did some research we picked Olympians who are from Pennsylvania, and we picked some of the Olympians that won medals. And of course, the kids liked some of the Olympians. Um, Sean, or the, the snowboarder, they wanted to tweet, and some of the other more popular ones they wanted to. So we narrowed it down to 10 Olympians and sent them. It was very brief, 10, 20 second videos that we recorded and used the hashtags that the Olympics put out. And Summer Richter, she was on the luge team, and she didn't win a medal, but we tweeted her, and she actually liked our tweet while she was still in South Korea. So the kids were super excited for that. I was super excited for that. Um, what an awesome experience for that. One of the Olympians, while she was still in South Korea, liked our tweet, and it just rounded out our experience and bringing learning to life. And it was such a great global experience for my kids. And I think that was just probably the highlight of my year so far. Um, such a great global experience for them. And I think they need to move the Summer Olympics while we're still in school because, well, with all this snow, maybe we will be in school for the Summer Olympics sometime. But I always like when the Winter Olympics roll around because there's just so much you can do with that. Um, but what an awesome experience for the kids. So that's kind of how I do my Twitter. I do keep my professional Twitter separate from my classroom Twitter, so that's why I have two different Twitter accounts. Um, but Skype, I do do a lot with Skype, and Skype in the classroom has perhaps the best website, and there's a link in the live finder for that. Um, but I do have a screenshot of the website for you. They have all of the information that you could need or want for Skype in the classroom. They have tutorials. You can sign up. They have a badge system. They'll explain it to you. They will help you. You can chat with them. You can join it. You can go on virtual field trips. There's Skype lessons. There's 
you can sign up and collaborate with people, mystery sites, guest speakers. Um, you can sign in here and they will handhold you. They will take you through everything you can want. You can also, and I'll tell you a little bit, you can also um, go off on your own and create your own Skype experiences. But you can just join in here and if you want to make global connections through Skype, they will take you through from beginning to end and you can get all your connections right here through the Skype in the Classroom website. It's pretty awesome. They also host some special events and you can pop in on those. The two events that they've held so far this year, the World Skype-a-thon and the World Read-Aloud Day Skype-a-thon. So the Skype-a-thon, which I spoke about before, was November 28th through 29th. And they wanted to do 10 million miles across the world. That was the goal. Let's see if we can make global connections and travel 10 million miles. Well, nearly half a million students traveled 14 and a half million virtual miles. So like I told you before, we made a connection to Italy and we also made a connection to England. The Italy connection, I went on my own and found my own connection. The England connection, I actually made through the website and it was through a Skype expert. So what I did was I did go through the website and followed the links and there's calendars on there and I actually found an expert who was a teacher and he, since there was a time difference there, I wasn't able to Skype with his class but he Skyped me from his home and he, we connected and he told me about the different global things that he did and then he Skyped with my class and talked with my class and he told my class what he was doing and he actually had a six-year-old daughter at home so he brought his daughter in on the Skype. So it was a very unique experience there. So we played the mystery Skype game with him, which was very interesting. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So those were my two global connections for that particular event. And also the World Read Aloud Day Skype-a-thon, which this year happened on February 1st. And that's a very interesting event as well. And Skype in the Classroom is very good about kind of having their events um, encompass your comfort level. So there were two different levels that you could get involved. You could simply have a read aloud that your class did and post it to Twitter. And that could be your level of comfort where that's how you participate. You could post your video there and share your video and you could be done. Or you could sign up on their website and you could either ask to be connected with another classroom in the United States or some part of the world where you would do a, a Skype back and forth and you would read a lot of books to each other or if you wanted to do a more global connection you could opt for a further connection from you and then possibly it would, might not be a face-to-face -face connection because of time differences. You might have to exchange a video with that particular connection because it, the time difference would be too great. So we opted to go with the level two connection and we actually ended up being with um, somebody in the United States. So we were able to do a face-to-face -face connection. But they set that whole connection up for us. So all I had to do was click, click, sign up and they set everything up for us. So they really do help take care of making those connections for you and make it very easy for teachers to get involved. So Skype in the Classroom does a great job of helping you make those global connections. So for the skype a day, what we did was I used Skype in the Classroom and I also made my own connections. So we kind of went back and my author from the Global Read Aloud posted a video of herself reading a chapter from her book. So we listened to her read that chapter and we connected face to face over Skype with our mystery class. So we did a mystery Skype game and we read a book with them. Plus we put a video on Twitter so we decided to do that as well. And then we also had um, another Global Connections friend um, previously who had a Flipgrid request and they said, can you please record yourself and add it to our Flipgrid? We were trying to collect all the different classes we can reading a book aloud. So we added our read aloud book to their Flipgrid. So we decided to have four different connections that day. 
So we had four connections for the skype a day. So that's another thing about the global um, connections is you can do as much as you want, you can do as little as you want, and you're able to do it on your own time to fit your own schedule. And that particular time, we, we were able to kind of use one video we posted to Twitter and we posted to Flipgrid. So nobody knew that we kind of used the same video twice, but we were able to do that and to share with two different friends. So that worked out well for us. Also, mystery Skype and mystery number. I know a lot of you said that you did um, participate in mystery Skype. And mystery Skype is a lot of fun, as is mystery number. You can use it with any curriculum, any subject area. You can make connections via Twitter or Facebook. Um, you can just throw hashtag mystery Skype on Twitter. And you basically ask for anybody who wants to play the game. And the way the game goes is it's yes and no questions back and forth. And you try to guess where in the world another class is located. So the way I do it is we have, I have large maps that I hang on the board. And my class has a little world map. And on the back is a little USA map. And I put it in like a sheet protector. And my class has dry erase markers. And we ask yes and no questions that I have on little cards. And we say, like, are you in the United States? Yes or no? And then we know which map to use. And then you ask other questions depending on the question before it. And you kind of alternate back and forth. And you can play the game any way you want. Um, the one piece of advice I'd give you with a global connection is the more you can connect with the teacher on the other end, the better and the more smoothly it goes. You can wing it, and that's fine. But the less you wing it with a teacher, the, the better it will go for you um, in the end. Sometimes winging it is fine. Um, but the more you can kind of nail down what kind of uh, what kind of things you want to say and how you want things to go, the smoother it will go. When a mystery Skype is impossible due to time zones or time restraints, I know middle school or high school, if you only see your students at a particular period or only a certain amount of times a day, sometimes that's not possible. And there's something called the Five Clue Challenge. And I have a website here that you can go to. I mean, it's a collection of videos that you can submit. And then you can create your own, which kind of takes it to the next level, um, which is awesome. And you can use the hashtag 5 clue challenge. And oops, let me go back. Basically, you make a video, or you can watch a video, and you get five clues to where you are. And you pause in between each one. And then that way, you can kind of have those at your own, use them at your own time. So they're kind of whatever kind of clues you'd want to say, have somebody guess where in the world you are. And since it's a video, you know, you can have the scenery behind you. I've seen some classes show the currency. You can show the kind of, you know, trees in the area. You can show what kind of clothes people are wearing. So it's kind of an alternative to um, that live interaction. So you can really take your, your Skypes worldwide um, and really Use, use it to your advantage if you're on a time constraint. We've done a mystery animal Skype as well, and a lot of times the younger grades like these. We actually tied ours into the Olympics, but we couldn't tell the class we were Skyping with that. But we, we did research on the white tiger, which was the mascot for the Olympics. And we went back and forth with yes and no questions um, with the class to guess which animal we were Skyping with. The reason why we couldn't do a mystery Skype with the location was because it was a connection from Pennsylvania that I had made at um, a conference we were at. So we were both from Pennsylvania, and we both, our classes both knew that, so it wouldn't have been fun to guess. Um, we were both from Pennsylvania, and our students weren't at the level that we could guess cities, so we decided to do an animal Skype instead. You could do the same thing with a number. You could Skype about a number. So just an alternative too, if you're not the geography type that you want to guess a place, you can guess different animal, guess a number. But just uh, to tell you about the power of Skype, too, I've done this with um, a colleague from the same district as me. We traveled to India via the middle school that's located right down the street from us. Um, I met him. Actually, he's from my district. But he was at um, a place where I presented. And he was kind of nervous about doing a Skype. So I said, I'll help you. So we talked. And he actually had his class make a kazoot game. They were learning about India. 
So we took his, we played his Kahoot game, and then we Skyped with his class. So they taught us about India, and we kind of traveled to India and learned about India with the help of his class. They were literally five minutes down the street from us. So he took us to India, his kids took us to India through Skype and through Kahoot. So it was a great experience. So the more you can be creative, I mean, the power of Skype is just endless. Um, you can also Skype a guest speaker or go on a virtual field trip. And I'm going to show you a quick video right now about a uh, field trip that we just took yesterday. We had a guest speaker from Yellowstone National Park. So I'm going to turn it over and you can see a quick, it's just a three minute video um, from Yellowstone National Park. Be really high and covered in snow, but then there's also lower areas where there's a lot of meadows or even sagebrush. So there's a lot of different habitats here, which makes it a wonderful place to come and explore. Um, and this is kind of off subject, but I want to show you this picture. So Yellowstone closes most of its roads in the winter, just lets the snow pile up on them. And then when it's starting to get ready for the summer visitors to come to the park, they have to go out and plow the roads. And this week, this is what they're plowing. Oh, that's more than we have. <laughs> a lot of snow. So the big, like, bulldozers come through and the graders and they uh, clear a path and then these guys come through with these blowers and they try and make it wider so that hopefully by and it can only wobble around on, I'm sorry, it can only wobble around on these legs. It can't walk real, uh, really well yet, but within a week, when it's one week old, it'll be able to keep up with the herd, and it'll even be able to cross, swim across rivers and streams to keep up with the herd. I know, what were you doing when you were a week old? <laughs> right? And then another big herbivore in Yellowstone that a lot of people hope to see when they come here, where is this? Oh my gosh! Oh. See that? Maddie. Elk. Oh. Elk. Elk. Oh, very good. Do you have elk in Pennsylvania? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, you do? Okay, because a lot of kids don't know that that's an elk antler. Now, I know that this is a male elk, not a female. How come? Riley, you? Uh, because the, the females don't have a ranger's job, and no, do you work at night? A park ranger's job, well, first off, there are a lot of different park rangers. I'm what's called an education ranger, so I work with youth groups, uh, but there's park rangers who are biologists, some of them are law enforcement rangers, some of them work in the maintenance crews. So there's a lot of different park rangers. And yes, most of us will work at night, um, especially during the busy seasons. Okay, and one last question we have is about Old Faithful. And we wanted to know about how often does Old Faithful erupt or go so off? Old Faithful is a very faithfully erupting geyser and it erupts about every hour and a half, give or take a few minutes. Um, so if you were to visit the park and you absolutely wanted to see a geyser erupt, this would be where you would head because you can be sure you're gonna see it erupt, at least until things change. It's still, still it's been erupting like that for about, a, at least as far as we know, for about 150 years. Well, guys, I have so enjoyed talking with you, and I hope you'll visit us again, maybe get another Skype call later in the year after you've studied more science even. All right, so thanks for visiting with me. Boys and girls, what do we say? Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I'll just go through this real quickly. I know we're running short on time. But there's other programs to help you make connections. And I know a lot of you have already done these programs. And there's a lot of information in the Live Finder and a lot of links. The Global Math Task Twitter Challenge. And this is great for differentiation as well and for math. You can either take in the information and you can also create the information. A lot of different tools that you can use. Follow it on Twitter. You can check out their website. I have information on how I use it. Um, you can use the hashtag, it's hashtag GMTTC, 
and then your grade level. It runs kindergarten through high school. You can differentiate by putting the number of your grade at the end. You can use it in one classroom, and you can do hashtag GM TTC2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or high school. I have some examples um, in the presentation. And you can also sign up to tweet. It's running now. It runs all year. Um, follow it. You can solve problems. Have your kids solve problems. Take a picture. Tweet it out. Um, sign up and you can tweet out your own problem. The global read aloud also, we talked about that. And I know that a lot of you are already or have participated in that. One book to kind of join the whole world together. And it's an awesome program. That will be running again next year, starting in October. Sign-ups are open now. There's links to that as well. Um, chapter books for the older students. And for the younger students, there will be some picture books and some chapter books as well. We were very lucky to have the author who was very active. Um, Skype, we did Google Hangouts, we used Flipgrid, we had Padlet. So again, you can participate as much or as little as you'd like for any of these things on your own time. Um, but I just want to leave you with the thought that going global is more than just technology and maps. Definitely lots of things that your kids are going to, work, going to learn. You want to make those real world connections, digital citizenship. You know, my kids learned a lot about problem solving. They are more aware of themselves. They're collaborating, those thinking skills. We want to get them ready for the real world and for understanding others. And I just feel that my group as a whole, um, a great group of kids, and they're just learning so much about themselves and about others. And the curriculum kind of just falls into place. And the kids really dictate where they want to know. And you'll be very surprised at they kind of tell you where they want to go and what they want to learn. And it's just such a fun experience, too. And there's never a boring moment in the classroom. And you make so many new friends, and the kids just enjoy it. And it's just fun in the classroom all the time. So please feel free to reach out with any questions. Tweet me if you want to Skype or hang out anytime. I'd love to do that. So please feel free to tweet me. And if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Yes, Paula, I did capture some questions as we went along. Do you do podcasts with your kids? Uh, just found Anchor app and was thinking of trying it out with students. You know, that's one thing that we haven't done this uh -huh. year at all. I have, we've actually made a couple of recordings in the past, but we haven't done anything with podcasts, but that definitely is on my to-do list. Okay. What's your favorite Skype in the classroom activity? I guess I could say it that way. Oh my gosh, that's like picking your favorite child, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's really hard to say because just when you think you have a favorite, then you do something else. I really like connecting face to face. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I like connecting with other classrooms, but then like yesterday was my first time ever going on a virtual field trip like that. And I have to say, I thought, you know, going to Yellowstone National Park, I guess in my mind I thought, boy, they're going to take us on a tour of the park. Maybe we'll see Old Faithful erupt. And then the first minute she shows us this picture of all the snow, and my heart mm -hmm. kind of dropped. I thought, oh, no, we're not going to see the park at all. But it was such an amazing experience that definitely I think I need to find some more connections in the curriculum that we'll get to go to do more of those field trips. And the kids were just enthralled for 40 minutes of her talking to us. Mm -hmm. that I, I'm not sure what my favorite is, but I just love those face-to-face -face connections. So I, I don't know if I can pick just one. Okay. How many of the, the other teachers in your building are developing global connections? Do you work together to do so? You know, I think more and more are starting. And as they see me doing it, Mm -hmm. More teachers are wanting to do it. And yesterday, I invited a teacher across the hall into my classroom to come in. Mm -hmm. So I'm inviting teachers to come and watch. And I think that is the way to get them involved. They need to come and see it before mm -hmm. they do it. Sure. So it's slow, it's slow going. I think it's intimidating at first, but it's really not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest constraint is time. When am I going to fit it in? But it's not something to fit in. It, it naturally will flow. And I think it's just the unknown. But once they see, hey, this is fun and it, it does work and it's not hard to do. 
So it, it's slow going, but I think the more you invite them in and they see it, then they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And that actually answered the next question. Have you ever shared a guest speaker you've had in your room with other classes? And yes. have just done that. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this, this teacher usually recommends teachers new to doing this to do a mystery Skype. Now she wonders if she should recommend something else. Is there something else that you'd suggest to start with, I guess? Mystery Skype is fun. The mystery Skype is very guided at first. It depends, too, on how familiar your students are with where places are in the world. So it's very mm -hmm. guided. My students did not know much about, you know, they don't know what's a state, what's a country, or, you know, where things are on a map. So it can be kind of hard. Going with a mystery animal sometimes is fun because they know mm -hmm. a lot about animals. Um, it just depends. So mystery Skype definitely is fun because they like to know, hey, we're calling California, or it's a different time. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's fun too, and like you can look, what clothes are they wearing? So they kind of look for different clues, and they feel like detectives if they kind mm -hmm. of can look and see, you know, can we find any clues in their classroom? Okay, those were the questions that I was able to capture. Does anyone else have a question for Paula? Do you do any blogging with other classrooms? I do not do any blogging. Blogging is something that I've always wanted to do, but I just haven't gone there yet. Mm -hmm. And Paula Nagel wants to connect during April for Natural, National Poetry Month. Definitely. I'd love that. Those were the questions. Again, thanks so much for presenting, Paula. I think we learned a lot today. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up. Thank you so much, Paula. That was that hour just flew by, and I know we're going to want to re-listen to that. In fact, I think it's a perfect recording to go back and share with teachers at your school when they see how easy it is to get started doing these things and how valuable they are for the students. They are going to love it. So thank you for sharing with us. And everyone be sure to save that Live Binder link so you can go in and browse through the different videos and resources right there. It'll take you quite a while. Well, we hope you'll come back every Saturday you can when we have shows scheduled. Please notice that we will not be having a show for the next two Saturdays. So you get a little time off, um, but didn't want you to not notice this. March 31st is Easter weekend in the United States, so we won't have a show that weekend. And the following weekend, um, I've needed to reschedule that show, and thankfully Sarah Malcho was so great about agreeing to reschedule it um, because I'm having some surgery at that time and won't be able to prepare for the show. So we'll be having Sarah with us on May 5th, so be sure to come and join us for that. Also, April 14th, Pooja Agarwal, and I know I'm not saying her name right, is going to be sharing some awesome things with us about the brain and memory and how we can really help our students capture things and remember them, and it's all based on research. Then April 21st, Jennifer Redgrove, fourth grade teacher, is going to be our April feature teacher. And she is one of Paula's colleagues on Fourth Chat. And she has fantastic things to share with us. And then April 28th, Matt Miller is going to join us. And you all probably know him as Ditch That Textbook. Well, he's going to talk to us about 10 things that we can ditch in education. But he's going to give us some ideas about what we can do instead. So please join us any weekend you can. And if you can't join us live, I know you know we'll always have them available as a recording following up. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher for the month with this form. 
that you can also find in the Live Finder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month as well. The video collections on iTunes U and YouTube. So there's a YouTube channel as well with the videos. As you exit the session, the survey link should open automatically. You can also take the survey from the chat box or from within the Live Finder. And at the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. Make sure you use a personal email address for this. Otherwise, it likely will not get to you. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks again to Paula Fellinger, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in this show today. Thanks so much for coming.